Brought to you by five guys who haven't reached third base. This is the Radio Scouts podcast with John, Mike, Andrew, Alan, and Nick. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I grew up in New York as a, as a young kid playing baseball and just being a baseball Mets, Yankees, you know, when my dad as a kid, 10 years old, we moved down to Florida and then all of a sudden realized that, oh, wow, I could do baseball a lot more because there's no snow on the ground. So uh, baseball took a, a whole nother level and, uh, and we were able to do it a lot more. So we played it pretty much became my only sport, my brother's only sport and uh, got to be friends with a lot of guys uh, around there that, that loved it. And, you know, St. P- Tampa, St. Pete was was, you know, pretty hotbed then in the 70s, 80s. As far as putting out Major League Baseball players, Wade Boggs and McGriff and all those guys, so uh, you know the love just got to grow there. And uh, and just before I knew, it, when I graduated uh, high school, I was able to go on to play a little bit of college ball, junior college, and I played at Bruton Parker. And I always knew that I wanted to be a coach, and uh, so I started studying hitting back in uh, in eighty nine, ninety. You know, helping kids on my team. Uh, talk about their footwork and why their L on the back leg should look like this and the hip rotates better and uh, that, and nobody everybody was looking at me like I was nuts but before you knew it I was getting kids better on my own team and my coach said man just keep doing what you're doing whatever you're telling them it's working you know so then I come home and I start do, doing private lessons in my garage to make some extra money to go out at night and it turns out to be that I needed an indoor facility I got so busy my parents to get out of the garage you need to you need to go do this uh, and and get out of here you're destroying the house you know so, uh, so I did. I opened up a small little indoor, and then it turned into uh, the Hitting Academy. And fast forward to 2007, opened up uh, the 10,000 square foot facility. And two years later, opened one in Tampa, uh, the Hitting Academy Tampa. Two years later, opened one in, in Brandon, Florida. That was our third one. Then our fourth one, we opened up in Houston. And uh, so, since 2007, I've done nothing but, uh, you know, run those facilities, open those facilities, and help thousands of kids on to college. I built a lot of college relationships with uh, about over 75, I guess, coaches that I can, you know, literally just text and talk to. Hey, Mike Bianco at Ole Miss, they got a kid for you. You guys should take a look at him. And, you know, they usually trust me enough that they will go look at him. Doesn't mean that'll give him a scholarship or anything, but certainly means that they trust my input enough by now that they will uh, go look. So it's it's been helpful to a lot of the kids that have come through the Hitting Academy. Awesome. Sounds good. And just for anybody tuning in, this is Rob Caravino of the Hitting Academy, uh, founder, primary hitting instructor uh, on the Radio Scouts podcast this week. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, Rob, uh, and reaching out to us and letting us know you're interested in coming on because we don't get to, we don't get a chance to talk to uh, those in the know and in the in the business too often. So we really yeah, appreciate you coming on. Well, great. No, I appreciate you guys. Uh, you guys doing this. Anytime we could talk baseball and enhance the sport, I'm all about it. So. So just from your intro there, um, there's an old saying, those who can do, do, and those who can't do, teach. So it sounds like you knew right away or early on that teaching was going to be the way to go to you. No disrespect intended, of course. No, I was a, I was a left-handed hitter, you know, small, smaller frame, not, not really going to do any damage past where I wanted. And I knew I didn't want to go into the minor league thing because I saw what, you know, how treacherous that can be, and nor did I have the chance. But um you know, I just, that's just what I wanted to do. I wanted to help kids. I wanted to teach. And uh, so that was just always my vision. It wasn't really about playing. And uh, yeah, the old, you know, the uh, those that, that can't teach. And, and I guess that's the epitome of what my last 30 years have been uh, ever since, you know, getting done playing. The only reason I really wanted to play at the college level so that I could have those credentials and I could see what it's like for a kid to play a 50, 60 game season and kind of be able to talk the talk and not just, you know, make it up. And uh, so that was helpful. And, you know, it just puts you at that position where you can talk about it because you've been there. And, and so it wasn't a wasn't a hard transition for you then going from playing uh, in college to uh, to being an instructor. I know you uh, you yeah, did no, intern no, with really the Jays. Was, yeah, it really wasn't because uh, I knew I wanted to be either a coach or or an administrator or something, uh, you know, in the, along the world of baseball. It's not easy to make money in the game of baseball, uh, you know, unless you're a top SEC coach or major league manager, or of course, a player, uh, everybody else is, uh, 
you know, pretty much on the lower end of the of the pay scale, you know, minor league coaches and things like that. And you don't hear about anybody buying Lamborghinis, uh, you know, as a double A coach for the Mets. So um, I knew I didn't want that. And I figured, you know, owning a private uh, facility, you know, could give me a chance to help a lot of people, uh, maybe make a little bit more money than I would if I was, you know, riding around in a bus. However, um, I did go to Seminole High School, uh, actually with Mike Bianco, the head coach at Ole Miss. We went to Seminole Highway back when in 85. And uh, last two years, I took that job over and became the head coach there to kind of give back. So I'm still coaching and teaching. And I did resign this past year, but I did it for two years. And we made it all the way to regional final. And, and uh, so I felt good about that. That was a fun uh, fun way to get back in the game a little bit, you know, in the uniform, so to speak. I just wanted to ask you about the the internship with the Blue Jays and kind of how that fit into your your background and what role you were doing with uh, with the Blue Jays. Well, anybody that's uh, that's been around minor league baseball knows that you know that you don't wear one hat. You wear you know about ten different hats. Uh, that was minor league baseball, you know, pre uh, pre digital era, if you will. So uh, it meant that we were running to the print shop to go get the, the you know ten thousand free tickets which, you know, had to be passed out for that game on Tuesday night by, you know, Sunday at the local gas stations. You'd have to bring them a stack and go to the next one. And, you know, so I did all that. Um, I called on local businesses for the outfield fence signs. I would play Mr. Trash one night and help the guys pick up the trash, you know, set up the bowling pins on the dugout and everything just to, you know, I wanted to put my I wanted to put my sweat and, uh, and tears in it and, uh, and kind of show that, you know, I want to see what it was like in the pro level. And I, and I got to see uh, I got to see a lot in a, in a year and a half. Met a lot of great people, and it was great for the resume to uh, say that I was with the Blue Jays for that time. And uh, you know, again, I would have if I think if I would have stayed with them for years, I probably would have could have worked my way into something bigger because uh, I enjoyed them, and I think they enjoyed having me. But um, I got a, uh, a baseball coach and a teaching job uh, that came in front of me, and I of course had to take the uh, the full time teaching job and coaching job at the time to uh, pay the bills. Yeah, for sure. And that uh, just to, to put on the time frame, that was 1992, kind of an important time in, in Jay's history leading into. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So how was, was that? Uh, what was that like just to be around that at that time? Well, you know, they're such a first class organization. I mean, every everything that they did, everything that we did, if there was a you know barbecue that had to be put together for you know a player or some kind of an event, it was never just uh, just do whatever. Uh, Ken Carson was Florida operations uh, director for many years and, uh, you know, class act and uh, his whole family was very involved and uh, we were able to, uh, I was able to spend a lot of time with them and uh, just, you know, when there's quality people in an organization, uh, you know, and you get to see it firsthand, it's a, it's a good way to, to, to learn the business and uh, everybody in that Blue Jays organization was, was first class and I'm sure they still are. And makes it a little bit easier to adapt to that, uh, the major league atmosphere, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, having spring training here uh, with so many teams, we're kind of spoiled. And, um, you know, you got the you got the Blue Jays, you've got the Phillies, you got the Yankees, uh, and so on and so up, up and down the coast. And uh, so sometimes you don't, you know, you, you're buying tickets on the outside, and not many people get to be the inside guy. And, you know, having keys to the stadium and being able to come and go it was an honor. It was a... Uh, I was 23 at the time, and I was, I was. It didn't matter what they asked me to do; I was going to do it. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, so just moving into actual uh, the skills of being a, a hitting coach. One of the we we kind of crowdsourced our uh, Blue Jays message board dot com for questions that people would want to submit to you and get answered. So one of them uh, that was submitted was, are skills like plate discipline and pitch recognition are they aspects of the game that can be taught, or is success in those areas more relying on natural abilities like eyesight reaction time and just like the the quick twitch muscle kind of thing that people talk about a lot years ago when i first started talking hitting uh i was very mechanically inclined to go after uh, a player's footwork and and distance and and yes all of that is important but if there's one thing that i've learned after doing twenty thousand or whatever hitting lessons it's really uh what i call the, the the life of the pitch it's, it's the amount of time from when the ball flies out of the pitcher's, the skin from his fingertips uh, until the time you have to hit the ball is really what the whole game comes down to. And minimizing the movements that you have to do to maximize your efficiency 
really is what it makes the guys who can go on and play longer, the guys that can that can get to the spot on the baseball in that short, short amount of time, whether it's point five seconds, six seconds, seven seconds, who knows. But I do know that if you go on a mouse and you go click by click by click by click, uh, you know, it takes about 25 clicks to get from the pitcher's hand to the bat. Uh, now that's on a slow motion frame by frame. In real life, it's it's unfathomable that we can even that people can even do it. It's actually so important that the Astros and whoever else that did it uh, risk literally their entire lives, their careers, to know the answer of what's coming, because that's how important it was. They knew that the penalties were going to be harsh. They knew that. If they found out, they would be in the position they're in, but they still risked it, and they still, you know, took the chance because it's that important. It's that hard, and that's really what a lot of this comes down to. It's a great question. You know, some people say you don't see the ball for the last, you know, 20, 30 feet. You, you kind of simulate where it's going to be, and, and there's probably a lot of truth to that because if anybody's ever stood in the batter's box facing 95, coming back with an 82-mile-an-hour slider, you start to wonder, is this humanly possible for me to read, adjust? Remember, I have to adjust my spine angle. I have to adjust my, my body position um, as the ball's coming. I have to be able to do these things to hit it in the best possible spot. There's only one best place for each pitch to be struck by each batter. Now, you can hit them all over the place. You can ground it to first. The same exact pitch can be rolled over, ground to first if I'm left here or push to the right side, or blast it over the center field wall. Uh, every pitch has the ability to do it to do something else. It's all what the hitter brings to the back of the ball, if you understand what I'm saying. So if, if a hitter has to do eight things to find that best spot, then he's going to run out of time. If a hitter's got to do two or three things to get to that spot, then he's probably going to be a lot more successful over the course of time. Now, obviously, quick twitch muscles, great eye-hand coordination. They talk about, you know, all the great eyesight of, of uh, Wade Boggs and of, of Ted Williams and, and all these great things. There, there's no doubt that they're very important. That's what separates them. That's why there's only a couple hundred in the big leagues. But I do believe that you, you've got to have that superior um, quick twitch muscle and also great eye-hand coordination, obviously. Um, and pitch recognition, you know, is it a guess? Are we guessing? Are we able to? really read spin, read height, read location, adjust to it and hit it. I guess that's why if you hit 300, you're going to be in the in the, the Hall of Fame because you're only going to do it three out of ten times successful. That's that's not very good ratios uh, in most sports. Very true. Uh, you touched on a little bit of, uh, of what my next question was going to be about, uh, like, because your explanation there, hitting is extremely hard. So obviously without giving away too much information, what methods do you find work better to get these guys to get all this stuff out of their head and just work on the one, two, three, rather than one through nine of how to get the best, you know, bat on the back of the ball. The best way for me to explain it uh, through a podcast or over the phone, I think would be to, and again, the gun topic is a very, you know, touchy topic these days, but the one thing we could talk about, like, let's just take a pistol. It's a uh, very powerful, it's very explosive, it fires in a heartbeat. Uh, and it and it has a lot of impact, and I think anybody in the world would agree with that. So if you could imagine, instead of playing baseball, we were going to take our gun and we're going to find the best place to hit the ball, the leading edge of the ball, if you will, when the pitcher throws it. It's the it's where all the energy is in the ball. And if I have to shoot that spot with my gun, I know one thing's for sure. If I was going to do it, I would load that gun, I would pull the hammer back, and I would get in a pretty good athletic stance, and I would say, fire away, and I would tell the pitcher to throw it. And I would wait until the last possible second, wait till the last possible second, and I'd hit that hammer, and I would try to blow that ball up. Now, I want to do the same thing as a hitter. I want to gather all my energy. I want to hold it. I want to store it. I want to store it, and I want to watch, and I want to watch, and I want to move to that spot on the ball, and then right at the last second, Boom, I want to explode and I want to try to hit that spot. And that is probably the easiest way for me to talk about what we do as hitters. We want to gather energy, keep it stored, and put it in a position where I can make those last-second adjustments uh, with all my power. Guns don't leak. You don't get, it's not like you get to hit the trigger twice. Uh, if you do, it's called a bad hit. 
it's you don't want any you don't want to leak any of that power because then you won't have it when you go to pull the trigger or swing. So, Rob, would you say that uh, a hitter's early age swing mechanics are grooved into his neurological patterns, and thus is it important to develop hitters at a very young age, or is that something that could be worked on, you know, over the years with uh, some training? You know, the old saying, uh, at first, do no harm. In other words, uh, a lot of times people will, uh, from my standpoint, owning the hitting academy, uh, one of the main reasons we've been so successful is because a lot of uncles, dads, and grandfathers have been telling their kids for the first four or five years of, you know, baseball, what their grandfather told them in 1984 and 1987. And, yeah. and, and I like to think that that's a reason why we're in business. Sometimes I tell them, you know, if they didn't say anything and they would just take that child and, and put him out in the woods with a bucket of 100 balls every single day and say, I want you to try to hit these over the trees and not tell them anything else, that the kid would show up two or three years later and come up to you and probably have one of the nicest swings you've ever seen in your life. But we're, we talked to them about things that are not m- mechanically correct. It's just that our pastime has told us and, and, and we force feed that. It is the number one sport where the education across the board is so disarray. It's, in, it's so bad. Uh, when you look from a scientific standpoint, I'm talking anatomy, I'm talking the way, like gravity, okay, the way the ball is coming down. It's coming down. The pitcher is standing on a 10 inch mound. He's six foot three, six foot four. He's got his arm up in the air. So at one point, that baseball is starting at seven feet in the air. The average ball is caught in the big leagues at 22 inches off the ground. So from the time the pitcher starts until the ball is caught by the catcher, it's dropping over five feet. Okay. So when you look at that and you say, whoa, it's not flat, it looks flat in the game. Yeah, it kind of does. But the numbers don't lie. The mound is 10 inches and the guy's seven foot and blah, 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 blah. So when you, when you draw that string and you start at seven, you go down to 22 inches, it's a pretty steep angle. And that's why... They don't want pitchers that are five foot six because if it's not a steep angle, it's not going to be hard to find the line of that ball. So we use lines a lot. We use strings a lot to kind of show, okay, this is the path of the ball. Now on a fastball, it's easy because the line is straight. On a curveball, that orange string or that string or whatever color we're using would be bending. So it's uh, let's just talk about a fastball. So if that fastball is coming down at, let's say it's eight degrees coming down from the pitcher's hand to the catcher, The question is, do I want to hit down on that ball? Do I want to hit up on that ball? Or do I want to hit equal and opposite the ball path? And for many, many years, we taught hit down on the ball and create backspin. And now we have learned through science that it's really C. It's equal and opposite the ball path is going to be the best collision uh, to hit the ball. And that's where a lot of confusion comes in with uh, everybody talking about you know, launch angle, launch angle, and it drives me crazy because I watch ESPN and I listen to guys that are 10 times, the best, 100 times better hitter than I ever was, and they're still trying to figure out what do we mean by launch angle. And I tell people all the time, if you don't like launch angle, then what you should do is go out into your car and rip out the speedometer and throw it in the garbage because the speedometer is simply measuring the speed that you step on the gas. Launch angle is simply a measurement of the angle that the ball came off you the bat. And it's a very finite number. Babe Ruth, every ball Babe Ruth ever hit had a launch angle. Now, if he got on top of it and he grounded to the shortstop or from second baseman, it was probably minus, you know, 22 degrees. His home runs were probably the same as Bryce Harper's are, 26 to 32 degrees. So those things haven't changed. We Mike uh, Hit Tracks was the first one, I think, to really start to talk about launch angle when he, when he made his his phenomenal machine, Hit Tracks. And uh, he was the one who explained it to me. You know, I've bought probably more Hit Tracks from him than, than a lot of people because um, they're in all my facilities, multiple. And uh, he explained it to me straight off the tee, parallel with the ground is zero degrees. Pop it up to the catcher, straight up in the air is 90 degrees. Half of that is 45 degrees. If you hit balls at 45 degrees, plan on being out a lot because they're pop ups. We teach guys now to start hitting the ball between 10 and 30 degrees off the tee and off of our pitches. Why? Because I believe that that's where most of the hits are. That's where most of the doubles and the triples are. For many years, people were telling everybody, hit down on the ball. Give me a ground ball. I want a ground ball. Last time I checked, they're catching most of the ground balls and throwing the guy out at first. And nobody's paying anybody to hit a ton of ground balls. They're paying them to hit 
doubles, triples, and home runs. You know, swinging on a line. To, so to answer your question, as far as the kids go, you know, the aren't that string that I talked about that you know we try to simulate the ball path. What I would want kids to do is I would just have them swing on that line and just do it high, do one low at their knees. So they have to tilt their spine accordingly to, to get to that different height of the pitch. Because that's what you have to do as the hitter's coming, as the ball is coming. The only thing you have time to do is to adjust the tilt of your spine, just like a golfer. A golfer is, already knows the, the club length. He knows the height of the tee and where the ball is. And he could pretty much close his eyes and pull it back. And he could turn that thing as fast as he can. And he's probably going to hit it on the screws. Now, if all of a sudden, right before when he pulled this, when he loaded up and he pulled the, the club back and he got it behind his head and he started to rotate, and all of a sudden that tee popped up and moved over eight inches, he's not going to hit that the same without readjusting his body. That's what we have to do in baseball is we get to kind of start our swing, but we don't know where the tee is yet. We don't know where the ball is going to be yet. So we have to be we have to have adjustability, and we have to be able to read adjust and then hit everybody always forgets that part they say oh just read the ball read it read it well you can read it all day long and if you think you're going to swat at it with your hands there's not going to be any power there because again there's only one best swing and it has to try to be on the path of the ball equal and opposite the ball path and just circling back a little bit to the hit tracks you mentioned there um there's a lot of technology used in baseball today uh there's rapsodo track man just to name a couple but you said you use hit tracks at the hitting academy so just to explain some of the differences between all the systems why is it that you use hit tracks over some of the other um over the other technological systems out there we we do have the other uh technologies um hit tracks was first to be honest uh they're all they're all kind of playing catch up uh i was just at the abca convention and and when you go to all the different expo halls probably eight different ones were using hit tracks to kind of show their tools you know uh maybe it's a t that they were uh using you know because he's got you know over 50 baseball fields you know uh, to the inch that you could go play at vanderbilt university and then you and he's within one foot or so of the distance or, or even less now uh mike don francisco is a genius he made this baseball simulator that you could go on there and if i say i'm eight years old and i punch an eight years old i just took yankee stadium and now my fence is 205 feet to dead center and then i could two seconds later say no i'm going to play the college level and it's 390 to dead center i mean this technology is unbelievable and and it gives me it, it's more fun uh because rap soto doesn't have a baseball field rap soto to a to a 11 12 year old kid is is, 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 is just that. It's data. It's going to give you the spin. It's going to give you, you know, the tilt of the angle. And it's almost too much. You know, we're teaching a lot of times 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kids. They, they just want to see how hard did I hit it? What was my launch angle? And to me, that's enough almost for me to, uh, to provide a great lesson. Everybody is going to continue to come up with everything. But at the end of the day, ball exit speed is, is one of the most important things. Because backspin is a myth as a hitter. That's a that's a whole topic in itself. And, you know, for many years, everybody taught hit down on the ball, create backspin. I'm one of those non-believers in that. So when I'm looking at Rapsodo and stuff, I believe that a pitcher can stand on the mound and hold a baseball. And if he fires it and he spins it 2,800 revolutions a minute, man, that thing's going to have a ton of backspin. There's no doubt. No doubt. Uh, you, you've talked uh, about countering spin rates as a hitter, and we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Like, Do you feel that hitters would benefit from attending some of the pitching programs, for example? The real question is, as a hitter, do you worry about backspin as a hitter? And that is a, uh, a topic that I, will, that I would love to. I've, I've encouraged guys to try to talk to me about it. Um, I usually feel like I win the argument. I feel like they kind of just get a little frustrated. I have a few points that I like to, you know, mention to, to hitting guys, and after a while, they they usually start to, to get it. For example, old school guys always talk about hitting down on the ball and creating backspin. Have you guys ever heard that phrase? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Oh, oh yeah. Keep the okay. swing level, swing down at the ball. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Like swing down right and, and chopping wood or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Chop wood, hit down on it, create backspin, so it gets nice backspin and floats over the 400 foot fence. So if that's true. If, if if that is my goal as a hitter, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm the batter, 
and remember the the guy's seven foot tall and he's throwing it down the, the and he's putting backspin on it, boy. He's he is Ben McDonald bringing you know spin. I mean, he's throwing down the hill. And my job as a hitter is to if I'm on the other side of the the tennis court, so to speak, I have to reverse his spin, correct? Because he's throwing it at me with backspin. Absolutely. So my my job is to change the spin. So what I do is I take my metal or my wood bat with no grooves, okay, and I have no grooves, no sandpaper, no nothing, and my job is to hit it and not just stop the ball from spinning, but to ro- to counter that spin so hard that I'm going to rely on it to cut the wind and go over the 400-foot fence, okay? Now, let's assume that that is true. Let's assume that I did that and I hit it over the 400-foot fence, but the next pitch actually fouled that one off, and the next pitch that the guy the guy threw me a nice back spinning 2800 mile an hour fastball the next pitch my coach says throw him a curveball and my pitcher grabs it the other pitcher grabs it and he throws it and he throws me like a sinker like a like a 12 to 6 spin and just burying it with top spin so now next pitch 20 seconds later here comes a ball spinning in the opposite direction and nobody taught me how to hit this one they taught me the same thing, hit down on it and great backspin, but it's already got the spin I want. It's coming at me with the backspin I need. So I guess if he throws me a curveball or any kind of a slider, I'm just supposed to help that spin to go over the fence. The truth of the matter is science has gotten involved somewhere along the line, and spin doesn't matter. What really matters is if you've ever taken a ball apart. You guys are baseball guys. I'm sure you have, right? Yep. You take a baseball apart, it's two pieces of leather sandwiched together by 107 red stitches. Take those apart, and you're left with 42 miles of string. Take that apart, and then you're left with what we call the Super Bowl or the pill, right? The little pink pill. Now, let's take those two pieces of leather and the string that's all messed up and kind of make it like a ball again. and Throw it up in the air and hit it, and it's going to go about six feet. And then you get all that string and you wind it all up and you jam it all and try to make it look like a ball. You throw it up in the air, you hit it, it goes about 10 feet. Then you take the Super Bowl and you throw that thing up in the air and you crush it right off the barrel. And that thing's going to go at least a football field if you're a good hitter. A football field, it will go 300 feet like a golf ball. Well, guess what? When I go get that golf ball 300 feet away and I come back and I get the string and I get the lady in Haiti to put it back together and sew it all back together... The only thing that's changed is nothing. My job is still to find the center of that pill and hit that pill through the string, through the leather, regardless of how it's coming at me, and and try to put that leading edge of that ball back through the center of that pill. And when I do that, that's called reach and percussion with my bat, and that's when I hit rockets all over the field. When I start teaching kids to try to create spin, I tell you what, we have a heck of a class action lawsuit against Easton, DeMarini, Louisville Slugger, all these bat companies, don't you think in 2020 they'd be putting grooves or sandpaper in there if my job was to truly change the spin? And how about the hitting coaches? Why aren't they teaching us two different swings, a curveball swing and a fastball swing? Exactly. I mean, they should be doing that. I, I asked pro coaches, do you teach two different swings? They go, what are you talking about? Of course not. Teach one swing. And when I throw the curveball at them, oof. They don't even know what to do. How about flips? If we're that really, kinda, you know, flips is a is a is a softball. That's a top spinning ball coming at me. Then I back up ten feet and I throw it overhand and it's backspin. Exactly. So you, you're a firm believer then that players could make a specific swing change on the fly to to combat like a high spin fastball up in the zone compared to uh, you know a curveball down and in. Oh yeah, yeah. They have to. No, you have to have your just like a golfer. His posture. You know how important it is for a golfer's spine angle to be perpendicular to the ball so that when he rotates around it you know the big hula hoop that you see at the golf range the 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 driving ranges yep okay so it's so important that everything stays on that path my shoulder path the bat my arms the my, my 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 the whole bat all that has to stay now unfortunately i have to adjust that the tilt of that hula hoop to the ball path so it starts with my spine angle i don't get there a lot That's why hitting is hard, and that's why they're trying to work you up, down, and all around. And if you keep throwing it right where their shoulders are, yes, you're going to get hit because 
they don't really have to make an adjustment. If you throw the ball into the sh- into the shoulder path of a hitter, you're not going to be a very good pitcher for very long. You have to keep making them adjust those spine angles, uh, otherwise you're never going to you know be successful. So how would you how would how uh, it's kind of a two part question. How do you get a high level hitter to to be able to adjust to that versus somebody who's just starting out? Like say, an eight-year-old versus, say, Vlad Guerrero Jr. How would you coach each one individually? Um, I would just always, you know, when I started really, really getting into lessons, I knew that I was going to have a lot of conversations like this and over the years. And what I decided years ago was I was always going to treat the eight-year-old the same as I will the 28-year-old, and I'm going to base everything on science. And I'm not going to try to make it harder for this kid, easier for this kid. I'm going to show them what the objective is. The objective is to, if you can produce 500 pounds of pressure in the end of your barrel, when you go to slam it, let's say, into a, some type of a meter, right, or some kind of a, or a radar gun on the top of the, of the top of the tee, let's say, that, that measures your ball exit speed, and you're able to hit balls 95 miles an hour at the bat, you know, in a controlled setting, then I would tell you you need to try to hit the ball 95 miles an hour off the bat every single time. Because, you, you know, it's just the shorter movements you make to the strike zone, the, the more you do, the less you're going to leak, right? If you take a big stride or a big leg kick or you drop your hands a lot or you, you wrap the bat behind your head, all those things are, are time-consuming that we have to get rid of. It'd be like an Olympic swimmer. He's already a phenomenal swimmer, but now he's got to beat the 1.20021 record time. Uh, the only way he does it, everybody's shaving, everybody's doing the same exercises. What has he got to do to win the Olympic gold? He has to figure out one less movement uh, to get him to hit that wall sooner than the other guy. Big league hitters, little league hitters, it's all relative because there's 12-year-olds that are that are throwing you know gas to these kids. So to an 11-year-old kid, his, his objective, his goal is the same as Vlad Jr.'s is, you know, when he's facing you know, the uh, Verlander or somebody in the box. So it's uh, it's all relative. You don't have a lot of time in, in, in 13-year-old baseball, and they don't have a lot of time in big league baseball. So it's 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 all fast. I mean, you, you know, me and you go sit right now and go bat against a 13-year-old, you ain't got a lot of time to do anything. <laughs> you got time to grab your bat and hope that you get the barrel on it, you know. So I, I, I don't really... I don't, I don't really treat anybody the same, obviously, if I'm dealing with a seven-year-old. Um, you know, we're going to talk more balance and just really try to get him to understand. I want him to swing the bat as hard as he can and not fall over. So we do what's called a three-second drill, where I want them to just swing and hold it. Thousand one, thousand two, thousand three. If I could get them to stay within a, in a circle, in a small amount of distance, then at least I could start to fine-tune them and, and get them quicker so they can have more fun when they go play the game. But if I've got them doing 12 things, that's like asking them to juggle while they're batting. It's not going to happen. And speaking of, uh, of Vlad Guerrero Jr., he tends to hit a lot of missiles straight into the ground. His ground ball rate is very high. How hard can it be to get a high-level player to do something like change their launching? Well, the biggest issue i found in, in professional baseball is uh, particularly long term uh, like if they if they've been in college recently a lot of times you know they're getting some of that new technology the technology is still is very it's fallen on a lot of deaf ears in the pro game they're acting like they're they're trying they're hiring a lot of the guys you know similar to myself and other guys that 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 studied at this level and um so they're starting to get some of us to bring these analytics into it i'm not sure the success that they're going to have trying to you know, somebody like me to walk up to Vlad Jr. and say, you know what I was thinking? I'm thinking you should try this. Um, it, it's because they've been ingrained since birth, uh, you know, to hit down on the ball and get backspin. And it's it's actually killed more careers than than, than anybody could imagine uh, because it's, it's really, it's not scientific based. It's not, it's not, if, if you look at, I talked about it a little bit, but I want to repeat it. The leading edge of the ball. The leading edge of the ball is if you were if you've ever been hit with a baseball, then you know where the leading edge is. It's the center of your bruise. It is that part that hurts for two days. That's the leading edge of the ball. It's not two inches away from there. It's the leading edge. It's the it's the outside edge of the ball when the guy's throwing hard. 
So what a hitter has to do is a hitter has to take his bat and his body and create a leading edge with his bat. And he has to take that leading edge of that bat and slam it at the leading edge of the ball. And when those two things meet up in time and on plane, beautiful things happen. And the minute you start to fight that angle and the leading edge of your bat is maybe cutting the leading edge of that ball and it's starting to get on top of it and it's starting to slice it and it's starting to fight signs, then you don't have good hits. Now, Vlad Guerrero has hit a million more bombs than I ever had. So he knows how to do it. Now, I'm not suggesting anything. I don't even know if he does believe in hit down. He might believe total opposite. I'm just saying that many hitters, if they are having high ratios of swing and miss, it's because they're, you know, the old saying, his bat stays in the zone a long time. Well, what I'm telling you, equal and opposite the ball path, if you're on plane with the pitch, you might hit it to third. You might hit it to first. You might hit it up the middle because you're on the same path as the pitch. But if I'm cutting through it and I'm trying to hit down on it, then my barrel is only going to be in that bat path for a short amount of time. So, uh, again, he's a phenomenal hitter. Uh, all those guys are. They wouldn't be in the big league. So I'm not here to uh, tell them what they're doing right or wrong. I'm just saying if a guy does hit a lot of ground balls, there's a chance sometimes that it's from being told at a young age, hit down on it. And I've had these discussions with many, many, doesn't matter, American, Latino, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, you know, they're, they're old school. A lot of the pro guys are very old school. And me trying to change them is an uphill battle, so I don't bother. Can you think of any uh, hitters that you say you're watching a game and you look at a hitter and – I just I feel like like if if I'm you if I'm Rob Carabino and I'm watching a hitter and I'm a hitting instructor and I see something really goofy say like a Hunter Pence <laughs> like that guy's mechanics are all over the place but he still seems to succeed how how do you rationalize that? Well, anybody that's in the big leagues, it's all my my you know I don't say anything about them because I know what it takes to get there. So they have obviously figured it out on their own and they've overcome the odds. If they're doing all that extra stuff, they obviously feel like they need it. Um, you know, for, for Hunter to succeed as long as he had and playing the big leagues, uh, you know, is, is a phenomenal task. That's, it's, I mean, one in, he's one in the thousands of people. I mean, there's only been so many that probably match his career and he doesn't, he's probably not a hall of famer, but, um, a guy like that, you know, you just let them do their thing. Twitter, uh, and social media has been phenomenal for, for me and my instructors, um, because where else are you going to get, you know, a super slow motion swing of, of Bo Bichette, you know, at 19 years old, hitting a 98-mile-an-hour fastball dead center out of Toronto. I mean, that is priceless. If I can take that and I send because we have a, an app, and I send it out to my guys, and I'll say, check Bo out. Bo knows. And look at what he's doing right here. Look at, you know, how even with a leg kick, even with this, he still keeps it simple enough to where he can make that last-second adjustment. And uh, he stores it well, and he puts it on the pitch better than most, and he'll probably do it for a long time. Uh, he's from our hometown around here, you know, and uh, he he's went to, uh, you know, he lives in St. Pete when he's not when he was growing up and stuff. So, a little bit of connection there too is uh, it's kind of neat. Speaking of Blue Jays or former Blue Jays in this case, Josh Donaldson's swing philosophy got a lot of attention when he's with Toronto. Is what he does mechanically that groundbreaking? Are you familiar with this one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm i very familiar with Josh Donaldson uh, and his swing. And, uh, and you know, he was one of the, the, the first ones to really come out on ESPN and say, you know, exactly what we're talking about. Get on plane with the ball and try to hit it 400,000 feet. And that's what he does every time up. He's under control. His swing is clean. It's short. It's simple. It might look like there's a lot going on, but he knows how to hold that leg the front leg and and keep it under control until it goes down and if there's one thing that i could explain to hitters uh it's not easy over the phone but if it, it, and i would encourage people to do this put a tee there let's say a batting tee and just have a hitter hit five balls off of the tee and what you should do is as an instructor is when their front heel hits the ground say now or clap right so front heel clap Front heel clap. I'm not watching them hit. I'm just watching their front heel. And it'll go, I'll clap, and before I could even get done clapping, they've hit the ball. And then they do the next one, and I go, now, before I could get the W out of my mouth, they hit the ball. 
And every time you start to realize how close the front heel going down to the ball being hit is almost simultaneous. It's it's milliseconds before. Do you understand what I'm saying? So oh, yeah. when you when you, when you understand how close heel plant is to hitting the ball, then you realize how important it is to control when the front heel goes down. Because if the front heel goes down literally two feet too early, you're way out in front. If the front heel goes down and it's and it, and it's click, click, it, you're late and you're blown away. The window of opportunity is about maybe one foot in the course of that ball path where you better be, and there's one best place, but you can get away with a pretty good hit for one foot. You start stretching at one foot one direction and one foot in another direction, forget about it. And, and Josh Donaldson has impeccable timing. He knows that he has to control when that front foot goes down. And, uh, you know, he's super strong, and he's just been doing it for so many years. got MVPs. Uh, he's, he's, if not one of my favorite hitters, he's in the top three. He's, he's just been doing it over and over and over. What, who are some of the most more noteworthy players that you yourself have worked with? Uh, do you have any that you consider to be, like, uh, your greatest success as an instructor, like uh, your students? Uh, I've had a few, uh, you know, major league guys over the years, but they don't generally come into our facilities. You know, they, they, they'll come in with a lot of, you know, we've had the Ryan Howards, and, and I'm not going to drop a bunch of names. Probably have had, you know, 50 big leaguers coming in train, but a lot of times they'll come in with their own private instructors, uh, you know, for spring training or whatever, maybe a week or two here. I had a couple guys, but like I said, mostly college players. I have a lot of guys right now. I've got two or three guys that I'll miss. The guys at South Carolina, Oklahoma State. Uh, I really have enjoyed the last five, ten years um, helping guys get to college and, and following them in their college careers. And uh, that's where my most of my time has been spent. Is there anything wrong right now with the focus on exit velocity? Or is max exit below? Like, is it a pretty good indicator of hitting upside? Would you? I, I think it's the only thing that really matters. Um, I know that sounds really general and cliche-ish, but, you know, uh, if you can bounce the ball off your bat, you know, 100 miles an hour, now we got to figure out if you can do it in real time. So, um, you know, if you come and do it in our cages, that's one thing, but, you know, the transition to live is the hardest thing, but um, I don't know why you wouldn't, you know, there's really not much else to worry about. You're not going to, you're not going to be very successful having a, you know, 80, 80 mile an hour ball exit speed. Uh, in college or anything because it's all relative to the speed of the player and it's all relative to the pitcher so you know you, it, it's got to go up or you're not going to you're not going to go up if you don't continue to hit the ball hard then the shortstop's going to make that play that maybe the high school shortstop didn't make and you're out you 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 don't get to keep playing so i would say ball exit speed of the all the things launch angle and ball exit speed are the two number one things because if, again, if I could hit the ball 95 miles an hour, but it's minus 12, shortstop's throwing me out by 10 feet. All that means it got to the shortstop faster. Uh, now I hit that same 95 mile an hour ball with, you know, 29 degree launch angle. That's at a lot of ballparks. So I don't worry about spin. I worry about those two things, ball exit speed. And, and that's why, you know, those other tools are great. Trackman's great, I think, for pitchers um, to show, you know, depth on the curveball. I think it's important to show spin rate because spin rate is important to a pitcher. But spin rate is not important to a hitter, in my opinion, for all the reasons we talked about. For sure. Um, you mentioned the Astros a little bit earlier, um, so I want to open the can just a little bit. Um, <laughs> obviously, knowing if something is coming, you can be ready to, as you say, um, change your spine angle. Or if you know what's coming, you, mm -hmm. you can start your preparation early. So how... I don't not want to ask you to quantify it with exact numbers, but really, how much better is it if you know what's coming than if you don't? Obviously, to fire three big league managers, we all know that it's a it's a tremendous advantage. You know, like there was people that said I would much rather throw to a a guy jacked up on steroids than a guy that knows what's coming um, because he still has to he still has to do it. And you know, and it's terrible and it's horrible for the game. And anybody that says anything different, I guess, is you know, would be would be ridiculed as not being a traditionalist or as a baseball guy. But, you know, I kind of have mixed feelings about it. Because if you remember, about two months ago, when uh, I think it first came out, maybe it was, you know, and, and there was talk of the garbage can and, 
and there was talk of that, and everybody was like, I can't believe those guys would do that. That was terrible. And then all of a sudden, it came out that there was electronics involved, and then heads rolled, and they were the worst guys in the world. Their lives were not crushed when they first, when we all first heard about a garbage can. Their lives were not over until the word electronic came out. And I start thinking about that, and I say, well, being an old-time baseball guy, we have guys at, at a college baseball game right locally that I sat there and watched. The catcher comes out. He's got the little arm pad on with all of his pitches on it. So the coach, he says, you know what? I could zoom in. I got a really good camera. I could zoom in, and I could take a picture of his armband. Have balls pitches. So we said, go for it. So he zooms in. Next game we play him. The coach is yelling, one, four, seven. We look down. We know what's coming. So technology is the only thing really that that is different. People have been trying to steal signs since before Babe Ruth played. They have been stealing signs. The only thing that got them was they went, the technology got them. Right. If the second base runner is sitting there putting down two fingers because he sees a curveball, well, the worst thing you had was the next one's going to be in your ear. That was the worst penalty. But it was accepted that, hey, you're trying to steal my signs. That's why the catcher hides him. That's why he puts him between his legs. Did we not think that somebody might one day have a camera 400 feet away in center field and pick it up? It's really kind of a, I'm a, I'm a little annoyed with the game because we haven't adapted you know, to protect those things. And now we're going to, right? There's going to be rules. There's going to be this, there's going to be that. And they're paying a heck of a price. I mean, they're, they, you know, who knows how many other teams are doing it? Who knows how many other teams have done similar stuff? I I guess, as I said, they, that's how important it is to know what's coming. They risk their lives for it. It was that important to them that they were all willing to risk everything they've worked for since they're 10 years old to, uh, to know what's coming. Can I hate him for it? Yeah, it ruined the game. Yeah, I don't know if it did. I just think they got caught. I'm sure that other teams have been doing similar stuff. You know, they they were created for a couple of years. They just somebody rolled over on them and they got caught. And yeah, I I can't see really that there aren't other teams doing this as well. I mean, it, it kind of to me seems like a foregone conclusion, but it just happens. Just so happened the Astros were the ones that got caught. Mm-hmm. So the only thing I will say is the only thing I will say from a hitting standpoint. And I made the comment when Altuve hit it off of uh, Chapman. I, I, I made the comment uh, to my family. I said, it almost, and I had no idea back then that this was even a consideration. I said, he's so good that he almost looked like he knew it was coming. And it, because, you know, you're talking about a guy throwing one pitch 103 or 98, and then the next pitch coming back with that backup slider. And he was so on time. He was not fooled. There wasn't a hesitation. There was basically. I know what you're going to throw, and I've just got to get there. And I'm going to be, I'm going to, the timing part of it's over because I know I don't have to deal with that. All I got to do now is the locating part. And if it's anywhere around the strike zone, I'm going to be on time. And uh, maybe there is some truth to that now, a couple months later. Quick uh, follow up question to what you mentioned about pitchers would rather throw to guys on steroids. Just a yes or no, if you want to expand on it, fine. Uh, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, Hall of Fame or no? I've been to the Hall of Fame five or six times. You know, I go through it, and obviously it's a, you know, a lot of times it's more of a name thing than anything. I look at it like a museum, uh, which is what it is, and I don't think it's right to exclude the, quote, bad guys, the good guys. I think you just go in there and you say, this is the steroid era group. This is what they did to try to get ahead. You know, here's their stats. There's a big asterisk next to it. Know that that was part of the game. You can't just avoid it and have and think, you know, the kids 200 years from now act like they didn't know that that existed. You know, you need to shed the light on it. You need to, you know, maybe they go in with an asterisk. Maybe they don't. But, again, when's it going to end? Because if we sit here and think, and, again, I'm friends with, you know, Brett Phillips and a lot of, a lot of major leaguers and, 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 and all these guys, it is a brutal sport to just to run on the field. 162. Imagine just running out there nine innings in a row, 162 times in like 180 days. You would be sore as can be. You would have toes would be hurting, your ankles would be sore, your body. I don't care what kind of shape you're in. So let's say today's, you know, you know, who knows? Maybe it's, you know, we find out how many guys are on greenies and we decide greenies are bad. And and uh, next thing you know, we decide that this pill is bad. Up oh, there, they're they're not going in the Hall of Fame. 
I, those guys, yeah, you could say that they knew at that time, and they were trying to. They were just. I think they were trying to just feel good about their bodies and and trying to be. It felt good to be able to rehab quicker and and play the game longer that they loved. And I think if they knew now that that they were going to be, you know, banned from it. But when I think of Roger Clemens, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm an old time Yankees guy too, and you know, I can't help but picture him on the mound just wanting to just you know shove and just just being the one of the most fierce pitchers in the Bay in baseball ever and he's not in the hall of fame because you know he he tried to make his back you know he tried to entertain the people a little more he tried to heal himself or whatever the case may be you know that's a tough one you know steroids are steroids are tough but to think that nobody's going to use enhancing stuff anymore because of that i think is foolish yeah i mean it just seems like players are probably finding different ways to cheat as evidenced by the uh, the whole sign stealing scandal so, I mean, I, I'm with you on that, Rob. I mean, I, I do think that players like Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens, they, they need to be in the Hall of Fame. You know, it was they what they were doing was kind of a product of their era. I don't want to, you know, get too off topic here, but, yeah, I, I mm-hmm. do think that uh, it's a travesty if they don't get in. Yeah, it's, you know, it's just some old guys on the board that, you know, going to hold to their guns because, you know, they're, they're not going to be the ones to do it, but... The way the world's changing, I'm sure, you know, nobody wants to be the bad guys. So maybe eventually, uh, you know, Bernie will get him in or somebody. Yeah, just sir, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Um, <laughs> so bring it back to the Hitting Academy. Where do you see um, the Hitting Academy going in the next few years? Uh, kind of where, what's your grand vision uh, for the Hitting Academy? Or do you have any interest in working in professional ball again? Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, I've got... Uh, we, we franchised uh, one of the hitting academies, so I kind of helped him a little bit. He's got his own thing going. We recently just sold the uh, the Houston location to another uh, group. And uh, so we've got Clearwater and Tampa running full bore now. And, you know, I'm uh, working with a lot of guys and a lot of local high school teams. And, you know, if somebody – I've got a few people that are that are wanting to franchise up in the uh, Connecticut area, so we're looking at an area there. Uh, so I still am entertaining uh, opening facilities and helping people open them not as vigorously as I once was. Uh, but if I find the right person that wants to do it, I enjoy opening these uh, and, and helping them, you know, learn how to help people in their community. And, and I'm all about, uh, you know, seeing it, seeing it grow. But uh, I'm just, you know, I realize one thing that if you go into the franchise business too much, uh, you become a franchisor and not a baseball guy. And uh, I was finding myself wrapped up in, applications and forms and uh, i wasn't uh i wasn't wanting that as much as i just wanted to help people get better at hitting and and draw revenue that way so before we give you uh the floor to promote whatever you'd like talk about whatever's happening in in your life um we is there anything that you want to talk about that we we didn't touch on no i don't think so i it was great uh you know to just chat about some stuff and uh, you know, you could give out my email, phone number, or whatever. If somebody wants to call and ask any questions, or um, you know, the one thing that I that I would like to extend to people, we do a uh, uh, where they could video their their son or their daughter swing, and they can uh, email it to my email, and uh, it's eighty dollars, and I go through it, I download it onto my computer, and I can edit it up for them, and I can give them some pointers, and I can you know get it back to them, and it usually takes a few days. And, uh, you know, usually a phone call or whatever to kind of help explain it. And then, uh, you know, if they're ever in Florida or whatever, they can always come down. We could do some one-on-one stuff. Uh, but, you know, it works today's day and age. I can do a lot with the email uh, by sending the video of their swing. What's your email? What's your phone number? If you want to give it out, we'll uh, happily yeah, give yeah, it out. Yeah, I don't mind. I don't mind. My email, see, my initials, Rob Caravino. So rc at thehittingacademy.com. rc at thehittingacademy dot com and they could just send me an email and uh and i'll get it so it's uh all three words the hitting and uh just send me an email with uh you know with your name and stuff and i'll get back to you and then we could always you know work something out if you'd like me to examine their swings i've done that quite often and it seems to be very helpful to people if you're in florida you know we the hitting academy is you know we're in texas we've got the locations there so come by and see us but uh you know check out our website as well the got a lot of the uh you know way to reach us and videos and things like that to look at awesome thanks again rob for coming on to the radio scouts podcast we really enjoyed having you thanks a lot awesome thank you talk to you soon